Throughout history, coastlines have been of vital importance to human development. Whether you've been a city-state or a nation-state, an autocracy or a democracy, your access to the coast has been your access to the world. It's been your access to trade, culture, and religion. It's been your access to technology, economic development, and food. It's been your access to power. Nearly 2.4 billion people live within 100 kilometers or 60 miles of the coast. That is 40% of the entire human population. The global economic impact from ocean and coastline related activities is estimated to be between 3 and 6 trillion US dollars per year. Coastlines provide us with protection from storms, they provide us with flood control, they provide us with improved water quality. They provide habitats for fish, bird, whales, dolphins, seals, sea lions, and a whole host of marine invertebrates. It's no exaggeration then to say that coastlines are a critical part of the modern human experience. But those benefits can also come at a cost. Heavy commercial and industrial activity along coastlines can degrade water quality, impair fisheries, and destroy marine environments. Those impacts then threaten the very benefits we derive from the coast making marine and coastal health one of the environmental issues of our time. Going forward, countries who wish to rely on coastal environments for their economic needs will have to learn to balance them with their ecological ones. The southwestern African country of Namibia has chosen to do just that. They have chosen to protect their entire coastline as a national park. They have decided that their coastline has more value to them as a continuous protected area than as anything else. Now, that doesn't mean there's no development or economic activity here. Quite the opposite, actually. And I'll get to that, but let me tell you about this coastline first. It is extraordinary. Pretty much the entire coastline is part of the Namib Desert, which is one of the oldest deserts on Earth. Most estimates put it somewhere between 50 and 80 million years old. It stretches roughly 2,000 kilometers or 1,200 miles along the coasts of Angola, Namibia, and South Africa. It's a notoriously inhospitable place. So much so that, in the past, Namibia was known as the place God made in anger. Now, I take issue with that because the more you look into this place, the more incredible it becomes. It's not an angry place, it's a place bursting with life and power and subtlety and beauty. In fact, the extreme age of the desert is one of the key reasons it supports the array of life that it does. Because it's been around so long, the climatic conditions here have remained pretty stable. In ecological terms, stability is a good thing. It means a large and diverse group of plants and animals have had time to evolve and adapt here. But that's not all. This is no ordinary desert. Those same climatic conditions that keep this place a desert in the first place are the same conditions that produce one of its most striking features. The Namib Desert remains a desert because hot, dry winds from interior Africa blow west, where they combine with the cold, wet coastal air brought up from Antarctica by the Benguela Current. The hot air essentially acts like a cap, preventing the cold, wet air from rising and forming rain clouds. No rain clouds means no rain. No rain means you got a desert. But that cold, wet air still just kind of sits there, and instead of forming rain clouds, it forms fog. 180 days worth of it per year. That dense coastal fog provides just enough moisture to the Namib Desert's flora and fauna to make it worth their while. Now, in terms of protected areas, like I mentioned, the entire Namibian coastline is protected as one big megapark covering more than 26 million acres and known as the Namib Skeleton Coast National Park. But technically, that mega park is actually made up of four smaller parks that, when combined, make up the largest formally protected area in all of Africa, the sixth largest terrestrial protected area in the world, and the eighth largest protected area of any kind. That this is an unbroken chain of protected areas is really important because, as we know, landscape connectivity is crucial to maintaining healthy wildlife populations and ecological relationships. It's an absolutely enormous area, and I wouldn't be doing it justice if I didn't tell you at least a little bit about each of these four parks. Starting in the north, you've got the Skeleton Coast National Park. Established in 1971, it runs more than 500 kilometers, or 300 miles, from the Angolan border to the Yuga River and encompasses nearly 4 million acres of land. 
That fog we talked about earlier is one of the main culprits for the many shipwrecks you will find in this park. Depending on who you talk to, those shipwrecks are how the park got its name. But others might say it's from the skeletons of the many whales who have washed ashore here. Either way, this park is rugged, it's wild, and parts of it are still unexplored. If you're visiting the southern portion of the park, you're able to explore using 4x4s and off-road vehicles, but if you want to venture into the remote northern reaches of the park, the only way in is via plane. No vehicles allowed. The Skeleton Coast is also home to an incredible array of animals, including desert-dwelling elephants, lions, giraffes, oryx, cheetahs, and ostriches, each of which have to travel incredible distances each day just to find water. Moving south along the coast, you'll enter Dorob National Park the newest member of the team and the park responsible for quote-unquote completing the protected coastline. It protects more than 160 kilometers or 100 miles of Namibian coastline and was actually converted from a nature reserve to a national park in 2010. The park is home to more than 75 species of birds, totaling more than 1.6 million individuals. After that, moving further south still, you've got one of Namibia's and Africa's flagship parks, the namib Naukluft National Park. Even without inclusion in the megapark, Namib Naukluft is one of the largest parks in Africa, encompassing some 12 million acres. It's also one of the oldest, as you can trace its origins as a game reserve back to 1907 under the German colonial government. This park is incredibly diverse. It stretches all the way from the inland Naukluft Mountains, where you can find the rare Hartmann's Mountain Zebra, all the way to the coast, where it's home to more than 50,000 wetland birds. You can also find endangered black rhinos here, reintroduced in 2007, along with leopards and cheetahs. Then there's this crazy plant called Welwichia, which only grows two leaves its entire life, but they grow super long and become mangled and eldritch looking. These plants have some of the longest lived leaves of any plant, the oldest of which can be more than 2500 years old. But the fun doesn't stop there. Namib Naukluft National Park is also home to the Namib Sand Sea, which has some of the world's highest sand dunes, reaching heights of up to 300 meters or roughly 1,000 feet tall. And finally, the southernmost of this unbroken chain of parks is the Spergebiet National Park. Now, technically it has another name, which I'll throw up on the screen now, but Spergebiet was hard enough to say on its own, so I'm sticking with that. This park is kind of a strange one. Its name in German literally translates to Forbidden Area because it used to be owned by a diamond company and only company employees could enter it. It actually is still used for diamond mining and public access is still restricted. But despite that, mining only happens on 5% of the park's area, leaving the rest as a sort of buffer zone. So even though people aren't really allowed to visit here yet, the minimal activity has led to an incredibly diverse array of plants and animals. It's actually one of the most biodiverse deserts in the world, containing 25% of Namibia's plant species on just 3% of its land. You can also find gimsbok, springbok, brown hyena, a bunch of birds, and more than 600,000 cape fur seals here. It's also worth mentioning that Namibia has protected more than 400 kilometers or 250 miles of marine habitat in the Namibian island's marine protected area. Thanks to the nutrients of the Benguela current, this habitat is home to a diverse array of seabirds, including penguins, plus whales, dolphins, and Cape fur seals. Also, on either side of the Namibian border, you can find Angolan and South African parks as well, making this unbroken strip of protected areas a transnational affair. So, how did this come to be? Why has Namibia chosen to protect its entire coastline as a national park? For answers, we need to look no further than the Namibian constitution itself. Namibia was one of the first nations on earth to enshrine environmental protection and conservation into its very governing document. Article 95 of the Namibian constitution says that the state shall adopt policies which promote quote, maintenance of ecosystems, essential ecological processes and biological diversity of Namibia, and utilization of living natural resources on a sustainable basis for the benefit of all Namibians, both present and future. That statement represents a commitment. A commitment from the Namibian government and its people to protect and preserve their country's natural resources. But that doesn't mean they're standing on the sidelines either. Ecotourism is big business in Namibia, and by protecting large swaths of land and animals, not only is the ecological value of these places preserved, but economic value is created. 
Consider these figures from a 2004 study. It estimated that 6% of the Namibian GDP was attributable to protected areas tourism and could rise to as high as 15%. 70% of tourism dollars spent in Namibia are spent on nature-based tourism. Between 2003 and 2008, the economic impact of nature-based tourism rose from $240 million to $317 million. The park budget rose more than 300% in that time. The Namibian economy and the Namibian people are reaping the benefits from investments in parks and protected areas. But it's not just national parks either. 45% of Namibian land is protected in some way, but only 17.6% is conserved through formal, federally protected areas. More than 20% is protected through communal conservancies. The rest is privately conserved. There are 86 of these communal conservancies in the country and they are maintained by the people who live in them ensuring that the benefits they generate stay in those communities. In this way, conservation provides a way of making a living just like other forms of employment would, and thus incentivizes preservation of wild animals and wild places. Here are just a few examples of how Namibia's approach to conservation is paying off. Namibia is now home to one-third of all black rhinos in Africa, its numbers having risen steadily since 2012. Namibia is also home to some of the only increasing populations of lions and giraffes in Africa. And finally, springbok numbers have risen from 10,000 to more than 160,000. Overall, this commitment to conservation is enmeshed in several layers of Namibian society. From formal recognition in the constitution, to locally managed conservancies, to a completely unbroken strip of protected coastline, it's clear that Namibia highly values conservation and the benefits it can bring to its people. Now, as with parks and protected areas across the world, Namibia's protected areas are not without their threats. We already talked about diamond mining and Spergebiet, but mineral extraction threatens other parks in Namibia as well. 4x4s and off-road vehicles threaten the fragile landscapes they are built to access. And of course, the looming specter of climate change threatens an ecosystem tens of millions of years in the making. But none of those things discount the commitment Namibia has made here. By voluntarily choosing to protect their entire coastline as a national park, they have signaled to the world that they are serious about conservation, that they are serious about protecting their natural resources while still benefiting economically from them. In a world where landscapes become more and more fragmented, Namibia has gone the opposite direction, choosing instead to connect large swathes of its land and the habitats they contain. That is why wildlife populations are increasing in Namibia. That is why more and more people are visiting Namibia. And that is why Namibia is a leader in global conservation. If you like park stories like this one, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. It helps me bring these stories to more people and it helps to support my work. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.